Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special event tonight with authors Murray Union and Jill Sanguinetti in conversation about Mar Mar I keep saying it wrong, Marie's memoir, A Different Kind of Seeing. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from where we gather from all over Australia, um, including the Wawandjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we're hosting from tonight. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. My name is Sarah Blodorn and I'm the manager of the Vision Australia Library. We're a national public library servicing people who are blind, have low vision or a print disability. We welcome many of our members tonight, as well as Vision Australia staff and volunteers and friends of our community. We welcome Jill and Marie and their family and friends and we're thrilled to have you here to celebrate your special book. I just wanted to give a brief description of the room before we start. So we're in a rectangular shaped room and to your left or my right are the doors, out those doors and again to your left are the toilets. If you need any help in finding anything, please reach out. We do have staff throughout the room. Um, here next to me on, again, my right and your left, we have three chairs and here we have Jill, Chloe and Marie. Behind me is a screen and we are, we are um, Zooming our event tonight as well. So we have people zoomed in from all over Australia, members of our library and family and friends who are able to join us virtually. The Vision Australia Library really takes seriously our role to highlight publications such as A Different Kind of Seeing, which celebrates the diverse experiences of the blind and low vision community. We are proud to have A Different Kind of Seeing available in DAISY audio format in our Vision Australia Library. Tonight's conversation will be facilitated by award-winning author, Chloe Hooper, who has brought to us books, including The Tall Man and The Arsonist. Thank you for being with us, Chloe. We look forward to hearing your questions a little later in the evening. So please feel free to um, share those with us a little later. And for those that are on Zoom, you can pop your questions into the chat and we'll get to as many as time permits. If you're using Zoom with a screen reader, you can access the chat function using Alt-H. Please be aware that any comments and questions in the chat will be visible to all participants. Just a couple of other housekeeping things. Um, we are taking photos this evening. If you would like your photo not to be taken, please let any staff member know and we will make sure that you're not included. Um, if you have a phone, could you please turn it to silent? That would be much appreciated. And we, you might have noticed we have a special little guest in the back corner. We have a little puppy in training um, and she's learning to be a seeing eye dog. So um, we just ask if people can let her be. She needs to be ignored as part of her training as hard as it is. Um, so try to resist. I know it's hard for me. I would um, now like to welcome Bill Jolly to speak about this wonderful book. Bill is an active member of um, the blind community. A lot of you will know him very well. And he's also the deputy chair of Vision Australia. So Bill, I welcome you up here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your introduction and for hosting this evening's book launch, book launch on behalf of Vision Australia. And thank you also, Marie and Jill, for giving me the honour and great pleasure to launch your book, A Different Kind of Scene. And good evening, friends, and welcome to Kuyong. And welcome also to those of you listening over the internet via Zoom. After a long break, we have the first Library Conversations event for this year, and it's a very special one as we celebrate the telling of a truly great story. I pause a moment to acknowledge the original custodians of the land on which we meet this evening, the Wurundjeri Nation of the Coulomb clan, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge Marie's rich Assyrian heritage, extending back more than 2000 years with their Assyrian language descending from Aramaic spoken by Jesus Christ. That's some reference point indeed. 
I bring greetings and best wishes from Ron Hooten, CEO of Vision Australia, who is unable to be here today, but who was enthralled when he read Marie's remarkable story. And as CEOs do, he made sure that despite the challenges of COVID-19, the book was quickly narrated and put into the Vision Australia Library. And I'd also like to uh, congratulate uh, for her performance in narrating the book and extend a welcome to Marilyn Barclay, who is here with us this evening. And I note that the book was among the five top books for April from the Vision Australia Library. So it's already quickly proving very popular. This evening, we look into the life of Marie Yunan as recognized, sorry, as recorded by Jill Sanguinetti. Marie was brought up in the northeast of Syria, a member of the minority Assyrian community. Middle East turbulence is nothing new, and Marie's family soon found themselves again displaced, taking refuge in Lebanon. Practically blind since infancy, Marie didn't go to school, and as a young adult, she languished for three years in Greece denied a visa to emigrate to Australia with the rest of her family on account of her blindness. Marie eventually got here and we're so glad she did. After some years of living in Australia as a young adult, without sight, without an education and without English, a chance encounter with a man named Ivan Malloy unlocked the world of hope and opportunity for Marie. Marie went to the Royal Victorian Institute for the Blind where she was taught Braille by Ben Hewitt. She later attended migrant English classes where she was taught by Jill Sanguinetti and they became lasting and close friends. She then became a qualified interpreter and for the first time in her life, Marie was gainfully employed through Foundation House. A different kind of seeing is a compelling story of dispossession, frustration, hope and triumph, and it's beautifully written. I knew Ben Hewitt, to whom Marie has dedicated the book. He was a kind and gentle man who mentored blind people by means as simple as his serenity, his patience, and his zest for life and fun. Marie became blinded when she was a baby and had never been to school. It was Ben who brought her the gift of literacy through Braille. Literacy unlocked Marie's capacity to learn English and to become qualified and employed as an interpreter. For me too, Braille is the bedrock of my literacy. I was born blind one year later than Marie, but I was one of the lucky ones. My parents were loving and held high expectations for me to get a good education, so my prospects were bright. Marie's parents were also loving, but they held no low expectations, no expectations for her to go to school. So her future was bleak. I was born and raised in sedate suburban Melbourne, not in a remote village in Syria. I started learning Braille in kindergarten and received a great education which brought me friendships with other blind children and mentoring from adult role models. Marie sat at home with little to do but listened to her family, take in their stories, and eventually to teach herself Arabic. I graduated from university and worked for many years until I retired by choice, whereas Marie was past 40 before she got her first job. I am therefore inspired by the stories of Marie's family and the union the Union clan as they make their way in multicultural Australia, 
retaining the best of their rich Assyrian heritage whilst assimilating into Australia's diverse mainstream community. I have met blind people all around the world. I've come to know that whilst many people in Australia who are blind or have low vision still struggle to achieve their goals, their counterparts in poorer countries face far greater challenges when disability, gender, poverty, civil unrest and dislocation are compounded. People who are blind the world over will empathise with Marie's challenges and triumphs as a blind person in a sighted world. The siblinghood of blindness, I call it, those invisible bonds of friendship and empathy that transcend unimportant differences like colour, class or creed. As blind people, we can all recount times when we have had to shuffle forward into the darkness ahead without a sighted guide or a white cane to pave the way. We can all think of times when we haven't understood something just because we couldn't see the obvious. And we can all revel in the mastery of new skills or the grasping of exciting opportunities that the kindness of a friend or our own grit and determination have unlocked. There is much in Marie's story for readers, young and old, to learn from, to enjoy, and upon which to reflect. We can all reflect on the challenges faced by non-English speaking migrants, recognize how lucky we are, and celebrate the outstanding contrib contributions made by migrants to our commercial, civic and cultural life. And younger readers will enjoy a short, easy to read, true life story of triumph over marginalization and adversity. For here is the story of someone who grew up as an uneducated, disabled girl, assumed to be unemployable and unimportant, who became literate, knowledgeable, qualified, gainfully employed, and the much loved matriarch of her extended family. So this is Marie Yunan's story, brought to life in book form by Jill Sanguinetti. Jill has done a great job to uncover and tell Marie's story. We appreciate her patience to tease out the events, both happy and sad, in Marie's life, weaving disparate events and recollections into an engaging and uplifting narrative. Thank you, Jill, for your, thank you, Jill, and warm congratulations on the result. And thank you, Marie, for sharing your story through Jill. The retelling of your darkest nights and brightest days can teach us more than ever you will know. Thank you, now, I'm sure you've heard enough from me for now, or enough for me, full stop. So it's time to call in the professionals. And I have much pleasure in introducing Chloe Hooper, to lead a conversation with Marie and Jill. Chloe Hooper is an award-winning author, best known for her riveting account titled, The Tall Man, Death and Life on Palm Island. It tells the harrowing story of the death of Cameron Dumaji, who died in custody 40 minutes after swearing at a white policeman named Christopher Hurley. Tall Man is in the Vision Australia Library along with two others of Chloe's books. Her latest book, The Arsonist, tells the compelling, the complex story of the deliberate lighting of a tragic fire in the Latrobe Valley on Black Saturday. I look forward to reading that one as well. Thanks for joining us this evening, Chloe, 
And now I invite you to go right ahead talking with Marie and Jill. Jill, thank you. Bill, thank you so much. I think your words um, once again uh, show us just what an incredibly special book we're here to talk about tonight. Um, I, I really love a different kind of seeing Marie and Jill and I'm, I'm really honoured and, and thrilled to be here with you tonight. And I'd just like to start um, by asking you to um, go back to 1988, I think, when uh, the two of you first met. 1990, excuse me, okay, <clears throat> rewind. Um, back to 1990, when I believe that you both first met at, um, a, at the Migrant Women's Learning Centre in Wellington Street, Collingwood. And there is a wonderful description, Marie, of uh, first arriving um, at the, the Learning Centre and in, in Jill's class. And I just wondered if you could both you know, describe for, for everyone um, who's, who's here and who's on Zoom what, what that was like. Do you, Jill, do you want to go? Oh, okay. Yeah, please. Do you want to make a microphone? Can you hear me without the microphone? Can I check you. this voice? The Zoom, yeah. Sorry, Zoom yeah. did interest. Oh, okay. Yeah, so let me, let me pass this down okay. to you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I was new. Um, Marie came into the room. She looked terribly, terribly nervous. Um, and... I don't think she knew what she was what she was going to do next. Very quickly, because she's such a good communicator, Marie um, made friends with all the other ladies in the class, who are most marvelous a collection of women from so many different different countries, weren't weren't they, Marie? And we, Marie had a really good sense of humour. Within a short time, we were, we were all laughing. And one of the wonderful things about Marie, she has a phenomenal memory, which if you read the book, you'll see the details that she remembers from her, from her life. And Marie remembered, when we came to talking about this chapter, Marie remembered all these students were there, their names, all the funny little things about them. And Marie, you gave me back a lot of my memories because <laughs> I'd forgotten the, these details. But the other thing I, re, I remember about Marie, um, after a while she had, she had her braille machine and I just had to, if I wrote a word on the, on the whiteboard, I would say every letter slowly so she could write it on her braille machine. And as I wrote, you know, say the word struggle, S-T, I'd hear clank, 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 clank. And she had the most beautiful smile on her face of the joy of learning, I take it. And uh, it was, you know, it's been, a, it was a real privilege that period I spent with Marie teaching. Marie, you had been in, in Australia for 10 years, I, I believe, or 12 years now, I realise, um, before this class. And, and can you tell us some of your memories of, 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 of learning uh, more English with with Jill. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sure. I hold it. Yeah. Thank you. I remember Ben said, "Marie, you finish this year learning Braille, and next year you're going to TAFE." And I said, "Oh no, I can't," because he said, "Why?" He said, "I said because I can't see." everyone there is sighted except I am. He said, don't worry, you'll, you'll be fine. You've already been enrolled. He was a bit bossy, which is good. I need that little bit of push. I, I remember I was very nervous and every word um, Jill was ex um, spelling, 
I was like going one step higher. I was very excited because I was learning every day at least two or three words in English. And I was very keen to learn. One day I went home and I said to my mother, I said, Mom, I, like, I wanted to be uh, like a kangaroo and jump and learn everything. She said, you can't do everything at once. You have to take your time. So I was very, it was different, completely different world when I went to Jill's class because I can hear everyone can see. And whenever she was spelling, my braille machine was going like a crazy. I felt sorry for all the students and Jill because of the noise braille machine used to do. But I'm learning. I was saying to myself, that's okay, I'm learning. Three, Assyrian, my mind language. And I taught myself Arabic through listening to the radio and Greek. Can you just tell us a little bit about the women that were in the class with you, Maria? In Jill's class? In Jill's class, yeah. Okay, thank you. I used to hear footsteps standing behind me watching me writing in braille or using my braille machine. And because I like people and I like to be with people, I like people to be around me. So I felt very close to everyone and uh, made everyone to be close to me. in a moment but I, I just wanted to say that um what the some of the um of your descriptions of the women in the class are, are very beautiful and as as Jill mentioned um you you have a, a great memory for um for for small details um the um the the lady who had been on a ship um coming to Australia when um when um, pirates had taken over and she'd had to quickly swallow her ring um, and had had to then wait patiently for it to uh, reappear. Um, that's a time, that's a one of the tiny, um, you know, there are just some wonderful moments uh, and you really bring this period and the atmosphere of the class to life. Um, there's also such a fantastic symmetry um, that you're teaching uh, Marie how to, uh, uh, you know, how to write and uh, these different, um, a, a more advanced vocabulary sometimes. And, and from this relationship blooms the story. So tell us about when the, the moment struck you both that there might be a book here. Um, well, we kept in touch with each other and a, a few years ago and so, so did the teachers from the Margaret Women's Learning Centre who were all who were a, a wonderful group. Um, we were going to, I knew Marie wanted to write a book and we all decided that we would write a thousand words for, for a publication for the Melbourne Polytechnic with a student. I, this was oh, about five or six years ago now, before we started. I said, I bags Marie Yuna. <laughs> and that was the beginning because when Marie came round to, we were going to work on our thousand words. Well, she couldn't stop talking and I couldn't stop writing. And I was so drawn into her world and drawn into her stories that I just said to Marie, let's write a book and, and, Ben Hewitt had already told her she had to write a book. So it worked out well. And it, it's been, a, it's been a, a, an amazing privilege to work with Marie over these years. I've really learned a lot from her. Yeah. Uh, Jill, Jill says of you, Marie, that you're a spellbinding storyteller. And uh, how, when you were first told by Bill and then later by Jill, you know, I think that there's a, a book here. 
you know how how did how did you feel about that what can i ask you what you you know when you felt that perhaps your story was going to sort of expand onto onto the page how how did that how did you feel thank you thank you well first of all ben always used to encourage me to write my life story you know i said i think it's boring he said no it will be a wonderful book and then like jill said when i went back to jill and she did her book and I said, okay, I think this is the right person um, to talk to about my book. Thank you, Jill and David. Well, I couldn't believe it. Like, even we were, like Jill said, it's finished, it's going to be published. I was saying, no, my life won't be. I don't think so. And I remember I was lying down. It was about 9.30 when I received books from publishers. And my niece opened that box and she said oh, here's your books and it's like I went completely into another world I jumped to another world and I was holding book in my hand and I said is this my life story in that book I couldn't believe it I remember when we start first Jill read beginning of the story for me and I couldn't hear it I start crying I was very emotional, but for a week or two weeks, I was like, I don't know how to describe myself. It's like I'm in the, in the ground and I'm in the sky. I was like in the middle. I didn't, I wasn't sure, should I believe it, touching the book or should I not? I'm dreaming. I wasn't sure what to do. Well, when I found out that um, I was blind, I never heard from my family that I was blind. Maybe they were whispering to each other or talking sign language, I don't know. But never, no one have told me I was blind. So I was, I was growing up with 10 sisters and two brothers. I was taking it normal, like normal day, normal life, until I knew I was blind. Then I stepped back from my sisters because I didn't want to interrupt them. And what I did, I have, I said to myself, I should have a storage room in my brain because I can't write down everything I hear. So I should have a storage room, everything I hear, put it in that room and close the door. So when Jill start, when Jill start digging and I, all the, the stories all came back to me one by one. Jill, she's got, she's got a way. I, yes, I'm telling the story. She's asking me questions, but the way Jill, she write down story is, stories is she put I I I take it like that she put like a salt and pepper and everything in that story to become interested that's such a you know beautiful description the salt and the pepper <laughs> and and can I ask you what other ingredients went into the into this dish Bit of chili, bit yeah. of cumin, yeah. <laughs> Middle Eastern. Yes. Um, yeah, um, thank you. Yes, well, it wasn't exactly, the stories didn't exactly come out one by one because Marie would start and give me all these wonderful stories about a childhood. Um, I mainly just took notes and then I had to quickly write it. And then in a week or two, if it, Marie was very busy at the time, it was quite often to get a, hard to get her to come back. But anyway, I would then read her. And as soon as I started reading, that would touch off other memories for Marie. And she'd come up with more stories, which I quickly wrote down. And then they had to be 
integrated in again. And this process went on um, for quite a while. And really, really important things, such as all the stories that her grandmothers told her when they were refugees from the Ottoman genocide um, and the terrible things that they went through, the, the terrible family murders and things. Marie didn't tell me these things until actually towards the end. And I said, Marie, this is amazing. Um, yeah, and so it was great. And so that basically it was very hard to get her to stop telling me stories because we're, even when it was ready to go to press, it was all being edited. Marie would say, oh, no, I just want to, can you just put this in, please? And I know, just this one, I had to say, Marie, it's too late. You can't put any more stories in because, uh, because there was a, an unending um, flow of stories, which I hope you enjoy. And I, I, I want to say one of the things I really like about the book, it's not just her description of the students, but there's so many people have fed into Marie's life. And I see it as the kindness of strangers. And I love the descriptions of people she has met, like the man on the plane who helped her and this person who helped her, that Marie has met all through her life um, and, and their kindness and their supportness and their goodness and, and, and the friendships that come from that. And it's, um, that's one of the, thing, the wonderful things that, that, that I like about the book. There are, there are so many wonderful things about this book. And, and Jill, what you have done uh, to um, sew together um, all of Marie's beautiful uh, memories so seamlessly and to have, have um, managed to, we can hear Marie's voice throughout and uh, it's, it's, um, very intricate and careful and and um, and very beautiful work that you've done and it's and it's a lot of work that that you've put into this so um, I just wanted to ask what what was it like actually you know rarely do you read your work back to um, the su the subject and, or and the and the storyteller so um, what how did that then change the the way that you that that you you co-wrote this. Yeah. Um, there were two things. Once you read it out, it makes you think of it again, and I think it that helped me to improve the quality of writing every single time. But the other thing was 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 the challenge that that I was a teacher. I'm a little bit bossy. Obviously, I've got more developed language skills than Marie had at the time, and. I could see how easy it was for me, and maybe I did it sometime to put my voice in rather than hers to, to sort of dominate it um, and not prioritise her life. So that was a sort of struggle. But um, yes, yes, and th th yes, that's right, because it was, it was I, and so it couldn't be me. But I think towards the end, and Marie and I have discussed this, her language became more like my language and my language became more like her language so I think after doing this for six or seven years intensively our voices didn't they Marie they sort of became together yes. and I hope look I must admit I did make up a few things which I thought <laughs> I did put them in um, but I checked them all with Marie <laughs> before I, yeah <laughs> I'm Marie. I mean, we lest any of us forget that we're um, sort of, uh, you know, historical subjects. So much of your life has been sort of dictated by um, uh, grand things in in history and felt very individually. But I understand that one of the things that um, slowed down the writing of the book was that you you work as a translator and that you. Um, had to stop conversations um, when there were a lot of Assyrian refugees arrived in Australia. And I, I also thought there's something so interesting about the process of translation, because in a way that's what um, Jill has been doing and 
and you also work as a translator. Can you tell us a bit about um, how you give voice to other people's stories? Well, I I say I'm I'm privileged that that I'm working with refugees. I really enjoy my work meeting these people. I'm sure you all know that 2016 we had about 12,000, 6,000 in Melbourne, 6,000 in Sydney arrive from Syria. And I said to myself, I'm going to put my book in one side and try and help people. I never, when, when I was doing an interpreting course, because I was the first blind person to do interpreting course. And when the nurse I met, then, um, when I was with my mom, she was in the hospital and I helped my mom and a Greek lady interpreting. And I, um, she said to me, nurse said, you can be an interpreter. I said, I can't. She said, why? I said, because I can't see. And she said, you just help me. You don't have to see to be an interpreter. And I said, no, I suppose yes. So I did the course and um, I'm working with refugees and um, I'm, I'm their voice, I'm their voices. It's, it's very hard to hear their stories. We all human being, we get to us, but um, I like to help because I have heard from my grandmother that both my grandmothers, they were refugees. So I want to like help them as much as I can. But you know, I'm sure that interpreters, as an interpreter, that I had a rules how much I can help. I'm sorry to jump in. I feel like we could listen all night and thank you for being so generous with your answers, both Jill and Marie. Um, but we do want to invite some questions now, um, both from the audience here um, and also on Zoom. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat now um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Did anybody in the room have any questions? Oh, sorry, need to be a bit louder. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and I will read. You, I will see your questions back. I hope that's okay, just for the benefit of the people on Zoom. Sorry, did you have one there? Yeah. I am. I am. Sorry, Valerie. Can I? Sorry, I'll just repeat that back. So, um, uh, Marie, what was your impression when you first met Ben Hewitt? I used to, I mean, before I used to be Association for the Blind, I used to go to the day centre in Coburg and social worker, her name is Lois Trickett. She came up to me and she said, <laughs> she said, my English was very little. She said, do you like to learn how to read and write? <clears throat> Excuse me. And that was my wish because when my sisters used to come home from school, they all used to be busy sitting around the table, by seven, eight of them and doing their homework. And I used to hold a book in my hand and say, I wish I could read and write like them, but I can't because I'm blind. But Lois said to me, I'll, Leave it to me. I'll take you to Avi Avi. I didn't know what she meant. She came to meet my mom and dad, and she had an interpreter with her. And she asked me if I want to go to learn how to read and write in Braille. I said, yeah, I would love to. And my dad said, I think it's too late because you're not young and what are you going to do? How are you going to learn? You can't see. I said that. Let me try. If I can, I can. If I can't, that's okay. At least I'll give it a try. He said, okay, you go and try. I went to RVRB when we were going to 
through um, the building, I felt, I don't know, I felt something, something's going to happen. Something's going to come out through that building. And I remember Ben was teaching a young girl. She was going to lose her side and he was teaching her Braille. I, he said, would you, he showed me, she written my name in Braille and I felt Braille first time in my life. And I said, oh my God, I don't think I will ever learn. He said, would you like to, to learn? I said, yes. He said, I said, it's not too late. He said, well, I think it is, but would you like to try? And I was very keen to try to learn to read and write because sighted people's world is very large world. And my world was very small. So I want to know about sight people's world. I said, yes, please. Yes, please. He said that, yes, please. The way you said it, I can hear you very keen to learn. And I was very shy person. Because Amazing. I, I, <laughs> no. I remember once Ben said, after a few months, he said, bring some homework. And I said, okay. Next day, he said, any homework? I said, why he's asking me if I did anything at home? So I said, yes, I did my bed. I did washing up. He said, that's a housework. I want you to do homework. Write your name of your sisters, your cousins. So that my English was very poor. That's wonderful. Thank you. And Ben was a very caring person. He was a very patient person. He used to make lessons like fun. And I remember my mom and dad, after probably 12 months, and they said, you're not saying much about your teacher. Is it a he or a she? I said, oh, no, they're going to stop me going to RVRB. I said, well, it's he. And then they said, you, you sister and husband have to go and meet him. So they went and met Ben and they came home and they said to my mom and dad, don't worry, he's too old to do any damage. That is a great story, Marie. I just noticed behind me someone had commented on Zoom that they could listen to you all night, and I agree. Amazing. Um, does anybody else have any questions in the room? Sorry, I didn't hear that question. That's right. I would. Francis? So. Thanks, Francis. So the question, Marie, do you think you'll write more after having written this book? Any plans for more books? I didn't hear the question, sorry. Have you got plans for more books? Oh, oh, yeah, I'm thinking to write another book. I wanted to call it My Grandma's Recipe. That sounds amazing. Is it going to be a cookbook or is it going to be stories about your grandma or a mix of both? Oh, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. Did we have any questions on Zoom? Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. That, that part came from um, Ben Hewitt's funeral where Marie gave the eulogy and it was an extremely beautiful eulogy to a packed hall. Um, some people here were there, I know, who was, because Ben was very loved in, in the blind community. Um, and one of the things that Marie said was, Ben taught me how to see a different kind of seeing. And I knew that that wasn't just the braille 
because Ben um, also taught Marie so much about life itself and she, he coached her to become independent from her parents and find her own way because her parents were wonderful people but they did think that because Marie was disabled she was would always be a child and treated her like that didn't they in many ways but through Ben Marie learned to become herself and to become her strong self and more independent and that was the other different kind of seeing not just the braille Did you want to add anything to that, Marie? Would you like to add anything to that, Marie? Um, thank you, Jill. Actually, Ben, it was like he hold my hand. It's like a little baby to teaching that little baby how to walk. And when I start like walking properly and it's like both of us, we broke the gate and I went out because I was just, I was like a, a little girl in big woman. Like Jill said, Ben have taught me a lot of things in my life. It's like he, he opened a new world to me. And I always used to say to him, oh, especially when I start reading and writing. And I said, the old Marie have gone. Now I'm a new Marie, thanks to you. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you, Chloe, for facilitating some amazing questions. And we hope that you'll keep them going long after the formal part of the evening has finished. Um, but Jill and Marie would like to um, share a few words of thanks with you. I don't know, would you like to come up here or you're welcome? No, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll say, um, Look, I've got so many thank yous and I know Marie has a lot of thank yous as well. Um, each of us has had a huge amount of support. I've got to start off with my very dear partner, David Legg, who has been absolutely with me there. He's, the, he's edited, he's been my computer go-to person, he's had ideas and he stood there with Marie and I all the way through. Thanks, Davey. My other family as well, my nieces, sisters, I, I'm not going to say them all. And um, many friends, especially my book club friends who are here tonight, I think they're nearly all here tonight, uh, who have done nothing but encourage us or encourage me in, in, in particular. Um, I have to thank Scribe, who are very generously published it and, I'm, and I must say I really enjoyed working with the scribe staff, the editors, and I learned again a whole new layer of learning about how to write from being edited or re-edited by Marika and uh, the other people there and it was, a, it was a, 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 an absolutely great process and of course I've got to thank Vision Australia for putting on this wonderful show. Um, not exactly a show, uh, a launch. It feels like a bit of a show. <laughs> and, um, and, and thank you to Sarah and Harriet in particular for organising it. Thank you, Bill, for your lovely launching speech and for being there beside us and for actually getting coming with us into Vision Australia and, and, and saying, come on, <laughs> we've got to do something <laughs> to help Jill and Marie. So, yeah. So that it's been, and of course, the last person is Marie, who I've has just been, I feel so privileged that having retired, I've had this wonderful project and uh, learned so much from it and from you, Marie. So that's my thank yous. Well, I can't. Thank you all enough, first of all, to be here, to listen to our talk or questions. They were wonderful questions. First of all, I would like to thank Vision Australia for organizing this special night. I'd like to thank them for everything. And I would like to thank Sarah, Harry, I would like to thank you very much, Bill. You made me very emotional. I was nearly going to cry. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank Chloe, 
She's a wonderful, and she knows how to ask questions. Last but not least, I would like to thank Jill and David. I am absolutely privileged. I was very nervous going to TAFE, but I'm glad I went. Without Jill and David, David, I wouldn't be here now talking about my book. And also, I would like to thank my special friend, like a sister to me, Veronica and Richard, who made an effort and came from Bernsdale to be here tonight. I thank you very much. And thank you all. I've got one more. Oh, we have the clap, thanks. Marilyn Barclay, who read it absolutely beautifully. Because I've heard it. Marilyn has, it did, did the audio tape as a volunteer. And so, and it's beautifully, she's checked all these little details with me. And she has a lovely voice. And it's a wonderful job you've done, Marilyn. And I'm sure the library members will, will enjoy it for a long time. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jill. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you for all our participants for being here. It was really uplifting and inspiring. And thank you for everybody that came along, our clients and, and guests. Um, so we'll, fa we'll farewell our Zoom attendees now. They can't stay for a while, sadly. Um, but we invite everybody here to please stay and keep the conversation going and enjoy some food and enjoy a drink and spending some time with Jill and Marie. Thanks everyone again for coming. Vision Australia. Blindness. Low vision. Opportunity. Vision Australia logo. Three navy blue ovals linked together diagonally within a bright yellow rectangle.